This week I'd like to take you on a tour of the Reims New Testament. This is a facsimile of the 1582 or original Reims New Testament. It was published by Create Space Independent Publishing Platform in 2018, but they haven't given you much information about themselves here. They've minimalized that and focused on the facsimile itself. Here's the ISBN. In case you've never heard of Reims or want to know where it is, I have a map of France here. This is Paris. Reims is here, so a bit east and north. The um, college at Douai had to temporarily move down to Reims in the 1500s due to conflicts, I believe, and the conflicts that were here in the lowlands at the time. So it was while the college was here at Reims that this New Testament was published. The volume is rather large. It is 10 inches tall, 10 inches by 7 inches, and I measure that to be 1 and 5 eighths of an inch thick. As you can see, it's just a paperback. To give you a sense for scale, here is the uh, modern printing of a 1752 update to the Douay Reims Bible. That's both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And they're similar in thickness, but this New Testament alone is quite a lot taller than the entire Bible in the 1752 revision. Here's uh, Knox's translation from the Latin from the mid 20th century. It's about the same size as the Douay Bible. And then finally, here's another paperback New Testament. This is the Eastern Orthodox Bible New Testament. And the Eastern Orthodox Bible New Testament is thicker, but not as wide and not as tall. The book is formatted into a single text column. It's 91 millimeters wide. 60 characters or so per line is what I count. And as many as 41 lines per page. You don't have quite that many here. But I've counted pages with 41 lines on it. The page dimensions are almost the same as the book dimensions. It's uh, 254 millimeters or 10 inches tall. 176 millimeters wide. That's 6.93 inches. It's a little less than the width of the book because you have the glue at the spine and the waxy paper on the spine as well. And as you can see, the characters are printed in Roman type. Roman type was an innovation in the 1560 Geneva Bible. So here we have 22 years later a Roman Catholic New Testament that's printed also in Roman type. The margins are a little hard to measure because they're not uniform, but at the top I'm measuring something like 23 millimeters, so that's just under an inch. The bottom is close to two inches. I get 50 millimeters. The inner, and I'm measuring from this line as far over as I can go, is about 34 millimeters. And the outer moves around a bit, but it's somewhere in the range of 35 to 40 millimeters. The font here in the text, although you might, might find it a bit challenging to read because of the old style it's in, is about 10 points. I measure the line height at 4.13 millimeters, so that's 11.7 points. There are chapter summaries, as you can see kind of like what you have in Oxford King James Bibles. And chapter summaries are in about a seven-point italic font. Text is organized into paragraphs. It's not verse by verse. So you have a paragraph single column Bible from the 16th century, and that is one of the favored modern styles. We've gone away from the double column verse by verse uh, formatting of the Bible that was so popular for so many centuries which was innovated by the Geneva Bible. Uh, verse numbers are given. They're here alongside the text. And the verses are separated by a symbol that looks rather like a cross. So 
This is the separation between verse 8, which ends with this word salvation, and verse 9, which begins with for God. So here's 10 in the margin, and the end of verse 9 is with Christ, and the beginning of verse 10 is here with who died. We will find in this Bible uh, occasional references in the inner margin. So the text, the Bible, and the verse numbers is separated by a line. And here we have references in the inner margin. Occasionally you'll find translation notes, which are somewhat difficult to read in the inner margin, um, because the Greek is printed in a font that's really kind of tricky to make sense of. But here's a C in the text that maps to the C, which is a translation note. Um, here's another one. Here's another C. On the is, and I can read this one. It's epi se. Right. There are also notes in the outer margin. This is about a seven-point font as well. And here, these uh, these track to the symbol here. We'll see that again at the beginning when we look at the beginning of the book. So this um, note here in the column tracks with this symbol, so the note has to do with this section of the text. Uh, at the end of each chapter, so this is uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, and at the end of each chapter there are extensive annotations. Now those annotations are indicated by a double line in the text. So here you see desirous and somewhere in the annotations here, we should see an annotation that begins with that word. So here, desirous to be doctors. The annotations are quite lengthy. They're placed at the end of each chapter. And they are also in a seven-point font. There are book introductions, and occasionally you have section introductions like this. This is an introduction or an argument of the epistles in general. Then after that, the time when the Epistle to the Romans was written, and the argument thereof. So this is the book introduction. These book introductions are in what appears to be about an eight-point font. The paper is quite thick, as you can tell, just by looking at it from side view. Sheet thickness is about 100 micrometers. It is, my estimate, is about 90 GSM. It's a very matte surface, very little reflectivity, it's white paper, and as you can see there's very little show through. If we look on the opposite page to this dark bold print, very difficult to see it at all, even when I lift the paper away. So it's very uh, easy on the eyes in terms of show through. There is print non-uniformity. Let's show you some of that. I, again, I don't know here whether this is due to the original or due to the reproduction process. I suspect it's in the original. Here's page 416, chapter 13, 14 of Romans, and just across the page. You see how much lighter it is over here than over there. Words of Christ happily are in black. And it's not that I have anything against people who like red letters. It's just that I find them very difficult to read. They're often printed in a sort of uh, pinkish ink. It's hard on the eyes. It also seems to bleed. It's harder to print uh, sharply, I think, than it is black ink. Um, words added for clarity by the translators are not in a distinctive font as they are in the um, more modern Dewey Reims Bible. The Old Testament quotations, however, are in italics. So if we go back over to the Book of Romans, it would be very easy to show you that. So here's Romans chapter 2. Here's a quotation. The name of God through you is blasphemed among the Gentiles. Here's the next chapter after the annotations at the end of chapter 2. We go to chapter 3. 
and chapter 3 is replete with, pro with quotations from the Old Testament. Here we have a number of them strung together. Book titles run across the top of two pages. So here in the Epistle of St. Paul to the Romans, you see it written partially on the left page and partially on the right. The uh, page contents, we have the chapter numbers on the inside, alongside the gutter. There are um, page numbers on the outside top, top of the page. I think really it would have been better had they re uh, reversed that order, because typically people refer to their place by the chapter and verse and not by the page number. Page contents, um, we saw were in the inside top. There are no headings in the text, so you have to just make do with the chapter summaries that begin the chapter. Chapter numbers are given in Roman numerals, and uh, books of the Bible begin on a separate page, although the book introductions, like we saw, sometimes can begin on the same page with a previous book. So here is the uh, intro to Second Timothy. It's on the same page as the annotations for First Timothy, First Timothy, chapter six. The um, Remus New Testament does come with some helps to the reader. Here at the end of John's Gospel, you find uh, the Psalm and the order of the evangelical history, which essentially is a uh, summary of what is occurring in the four Gospels. We would call it a Gospel Harmony. So we have columns for Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and where different events occurred. So it maps the event to the chapter number in each of these four books. You have something uh, also of value after the book of Acts. So we'll go to the end of Acts and I'll show you that. It's a section on Peter, Paul, and the other apostles. And so, here it is. End of the book of Acts. And the sum of the Acts of the Apostles containing especially the gists of the two principal apostles. Table of St. Peter. Table of St. Paul. and of the other Apostles. And here's the Apostles' Creed as well. And then we come to the argument of the Epistles in general. So this is one of those section summaries, which is followed by a book introduction. If we go to the end of the New Testament, after the book of Revelation, called here the Apocalypse, we have a, a table of readings for the church year. So these are the epistles and the gospel readings. So for the first Sunday in Advent, which begins the church year, you go to page 415, and that's the epistle, and the gospel is on page 199. So let's just check that and see if that works that way. We go to page 199, which is here. Um, and here we go, the gospel upon the sun. The, f the one Sunday in Advent, so the first Sunday in Advent. And so the Gospel reading begins here with, and there shall be signs in the sun and the moon, and it ends with this symbol, as we will see when we get to the front of the book. So where were we? We were back here, and we saw the table of readings. So here we are, the table of readings of the Gospels and the Epistles throughout the year. That's followed by an ample and particular table directing the reader to all Catholic truths. So this is a, kind of an index to the notes. These annotations, as we saw, are rather lengthy in their polemic in nature, or polemical. And so if you wanted to know what um, the annotations say, say about grace, um, 
God offers his grace and man may refuse it. So they're saying that grace is something that can be refused. Then you go to page 706 and you'll find something there, or page 408 in the margin. So let's just do that. Let's go to page 706 and see what they say. 3, 704, 705, 706, and here in the margin it says uh, <clears throat> God first called upon man, uh, and uh, he first, God first calls upon man and knocks at the door of his heart, that is to say, offers his grace, and it lies in man to give consent by free will Holpen also by his grace, so to give uh, consent by free will that is also helped by his grace. And so that's the way one would use these uh, annotations, what they call a table of controversies. After the table of controversies, there's a section called the explication of certain words in this translation, it's not familiar to the vulgar reader because they leave a lot of things here that are fairly close to um, the original Latin that they're translating from. So, about a page of that. And then you have a section of faults that you should correct. So you should go back with a pencil or pen and uh, change things that are written this way to this way. Those are errata. Well, we saw it's a glued paperback. Um, because of the way it's bound in glue, it will not stay open at the beginning or the end. But it does lie relatively open anywhere near the middle if you can just get enough weight on both sides. In the front, if we go around to the front, Again, there's nothing from the uh, publisher to indicate who published this facsimile. You have a title page printed at Reims, 1582, by John Fogney. With privilege. Here's the censure and approbation. It's in Latin, with the names of the people who authorized it in Latin, and then a quotation from St. Augustine. Augustine of Hippo, and happily for us non-Latin readers, they give us the translation. Then there's a preface to the reader. This is a lengthy preface, which we may uh, go back and look at more closely later. And after the preface, there's a key to the symbols. Gone a little too far. So here's the key to the, the signification or meaning of the numbers and marks used in the New Testament. So here's the cross we saw earlier that marks the verse division. Here's the little note annotation. This is the symbol for annotations at the end of each chapter. Um, this is for references. This is for alternate readings. These are for marginal notes, as we've seen. This is the way they abbreviate the book titles. And this mark, again, marks the end of a gospel or epistle reading, which is indicated in the margin. And uh, the books of the New Testament, according to the count of the Catholic Church. And then, then a number of quotations from early Christian writers having to do with the scriptures. And after that, we come to a summary for the New Testament, followed by the summary for the four Gospels, followed by the summary of St. Matthew's Gospel. And then you are in Matthew's Gospel, and chapter 1 begins with an illustrated um, capital T. Uh, here I'd like to do a bit of a font and format comparison. On the left we have the uh, Reims 1582 New Testament, and on the right is the uh, Douay Reims. This is a modern printing 
of Challoner's 1750 to 1752 revision of the uh, Douay Reims Bible. So um, this is obviously in an out of uh, out of date type print style. The uh, S's often look like F's with only a small bit of the crossbar, and uh, V's and W's are printed in strange ways. Um, U's sometimes look like V's, and V's sometimes like, look like U's, and W's look like two V's next to each other, as you see here in the word wiped. But uh, This modern printing of an older Bible actually has a whiter paper than this old copy I have of the newer version on the right. I wanted to give you a sense for the historical context, so I prepared this uh, timeline which shows uh, Elizabeth becoming queen in 1558 after her sister Mary died. Mary was a Roman Catholic and had returned the country to papal obedience, but Parliament recognized Elizabeth as governor of the church and required use of the prayer book, essentially the same prayer book that had been used in Edward VI's time. The uh, English Roman Catholics established a college at Douay, which uh, later moved temporarily to Reims, which is where it was when this New Testament was published. This is the same time frame when the Council of Trent was having its final meetings, and Pope Pius IV was ensuring that Catholics, um, Catholic laymen could only read the scripture in the vulgar tongue uh, if they had permission from a bishop or an inquisitor. It's also the time when Holland, Holland was uh, making war against Spain for independence, which I think, if I remember correctly, is the reason that the college at Douai had to move farther away from Belgium, or what is now Belgium. Um, in 1568, you had the publication of the Bishop's Bible. In 1570 was a very important event when Pius V issued the bull Regnans and Excelsis, which uh, declared Elizabeth a heretic, released her subjects from obedience to her. It also excommunicated anyone that would remain in obedience to her. Uh, around the same time, you had the St. Bartholomew, Bartholomew's Day Massacre, which if you don't haven't heard about, you should look that up. Um, and um, because of that bull, um, people like Edmund Campion were considered uh, not just heretics, but traitors when they were trying to convert people to Roman Catholicism. And as you can see, the numbers there, I don't remember my source for that, but uh, quite a large number of Catholic priests and laymen were killed for their faith in England during that time frame. So that was the era in which the Reims New Testament was published. The uh, execution of Mary, Queen of Scots, sort of triggered the Spanish Armada, which was defeated. And then you had, after the Reims New Testament was published, which was based on Latin, you had the publication of the Clementine edition of the Vulgate. Elizabeth died in 1603, James became king, and the King James Bible was published in 1611, about two years after the publication of the complete Douay Reims Bible, the Old Testament was published in 1609 and 1610. According to Blackford Condit in his The History of the English Bible, published in 1882, uh, Gregory Martin was the principal translator of the Reims Old Testament. It says, in 1578, the college was transferred temporarily to Reims, here he, Gregory Martin, completed and published his translation of the New Testament known as the Reims Version. Also, according to the same source, Richard Bristow was the man uh, responsible for the annotations that we've seen, the rather lengthy annotations at the end of each chapter. To give you a sense for the character of the translation, I'll read the first five verses of Galatians chapter 3, verse 5, and then we will, I will show you a chart where I have the 1582 original Reims New Testament on the left and Challoner's 1752 revision on the right to give you a sense for how extensive Challoner's changes were. And I think you'll see from this example at least that in places uh, they were fairly extensive. So it reads, oh we have a decorative O here, 
O senseless Galatians, who hath bewitched you not to obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was proscribed, being crucified among you? This only but I learn of you. By the works of the law did you receive the Spirit, or by the hearing of the faith? Are you so foolish that whereas you began with the Spirit, now you will be consummate with the flesh? Have you suffered so great things without cause, if yet without cause? He therefore that giveth you the Spirit, and worketh miracles among you by the works of the law, or by the hearing of the faith, doeth he it. And here's the chart. So I'll let you pause if you want to examine that in detail. To give you a bit more sense for the translation, let's look at Ephesians 3, 8, and part of 9. To me, the least of all the saints has given this grace among the Gentiles to evangelize the unsearchable riches of Christ and to illuminate all men what is the dispensation of the sacrament hidden from worlds in God. So that's interesting. Rather than use the Greek-based word mystery, they use the Latin-based sacrament there. So we'll go over to the next chapter, chapter 4, verse 30, where it says, And constristate not the Holy Spirit of God, in which you are signed unto the day of redemption. So this is where that table at the back of the book comes in handy. What does contristate mean? I certainly don't use that in my normal day-to-day -day vocabulary. But here it says it means the word signifieth to make heavy and sad. So this is the definition of it here, heavy and sad. All right, one last one in this little section. We'll go to Philippians. And this would be chapter 2, verse 7. Um, who, when he was in the form of God, thought it no robbery himself to be equal to God, but he ex inanited himself, ex inanited himself, taking the form of a servant. So we'll go to the back again and see what ex inanited means. And it means abased exceedingly. I want to take a look at the notes, um, a few of them anyway. One of the things I like about the notes is that you can get back to the source verse very easily because they mark this came from Matthew 6.24. I started reading at Matthew and I was very uh, amazed at how polemical these notes uh, are. Uh, also, the anti-Calvinistic or anti-reformed bias of them, which indicates to me that uh, the author at least perceived the church in England, and I think accurately, as being a reformed church at that time, and not what we now conceive of as Anglican. It's something based on um, a via media and scripture uh, tradition and and uh, reason, a three-legged stool, but rather um, a church... Uh, that Calvin would have approved of. So two masters, the, the note says, two religions, God and Baal, Christ and Calvin, Mass and Communion, the Catholic Church and heretical conventicles. Let them mark this lesson of our Savior that think they may serve all masters, all times, all religions. So this is essentially a note to the Catholics in England not to attend the heretical conventicles of the Church of England. This is a note on uh, Matthew 3, 2, where the Reims New Testament says, do penance, but the uh, Protestant translations at the time said repent. And the author of the note makes the point that the words signify perfect repentance, which uh, has not only confession and amendment, but contrition or sorrow for the offense and painful satisfaction involved in it. So uh, they did not like repent 
at all there. They really prefer due penance. To give you more sense for the nature of the notes, uh, this is Matthew twenty, uh, Matthew 16, 16 through 19, where Peter makes his confession that Jesus is the Christ, and uh, Jesus names him Peter and makes the statement about the rock and the gates of hell not prevailing about the church that he's going to build on the rock. Uh, but the point I wanted to, to make is uh, to show you the extensive annotations here. So here's the note that says, Blessed art thou, in verse six, 17. And then there's a note on, I say unto thee. And, uh, pause these if you want to read them. I'm not going to go into them. Thou art Peter. And upon this rock. And it goes on. And then a note on rock. And at the top of the next page, a note on build my church, one on the gates of hell, one on to thee, one on the keys, one on whatsoever thou shalt bind, one on loose, and finally one on works. I want to take a note, a look at a note on uh, 1 John chapter 4. Verse 3, we'll read a little bit of verse 2 leading into it. Every spirit that confesseth Jesus Christ to have come in the flesh, I'm mean, sorry, in flesh, is of God, and every spirit that dissolveth Jesus is not of God. That's a very interesting reading there, that dissolveth Jesus. And we see that there's a note on this reading, and so we go over a page or two. We'll zoom in a bit so that you can see it a little bit better. Um, this is the note on that dissolveth, and it says, uh, This is one place by which we may see that the common Greek copies be not ever authentical, that is, they're not always authentical, and that our all old approved translation, that is the Latin, may uh, not always be examined by the Greek that now is, which the Protestants only follow, that they follow that only, that is, they follow only the the Greek that was then available in Western Europe, but that it is to be presupposed that when our old Latin text differeth plainly from the Greek, that in old time either all or the more approved Greek reading was otherwise than that often the said Greek was corrupted, and that often the said Greek was corrupted then or since by the heretics or otherwise. And so they're saying the Latin trumps the Greek when the Latin disagrees with the Greek. There's an interesting note on Romans uh, chapter 5, verse 14, um, which reads here, but, uh, but death reigned from Adam unto Moses, even on them also, that sin not after the similitude of the prevarication of Adam, who is a figure of him to come. And so the explanatory note here on, on unto Moses reads in part, uh, it talks about those who didn't actually sin, um, and that not in them only which actually sinned as Adam did, but in infants which never did actually offend, and only were born and conceived in sin, that is to say, having their natures defiled, destitute of justice, and averted from God and Adam, and by their descent from him, Christ only accepted, being conceived without man's seed, and then this is the key point, and his mother for his honor and by his special protection. But then parenthetically, as many godly devout men judge, preserved from the same. So the note's perspective is that Mary is included amongst those who are not tainted by original sin, but that it's not actually a teaching, it's an opinion of many godly devout men. Uh, and it says also the same here in the side column, Christ only not conceived in sin, and, as it is thought, our Blessed Lady. It had not yet been defined, the uh, doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. I want to take a look at a couple of sections from the preface. This, I think, is page 4. 
And you may remember from the timeline I showed earlier that in 1564, Pope Pius IV limited the reading of the scriptures in the vulgar tongue to laymen with permission from bishops or inquisitors. This uh, passage here makes reference to that. It says that the holy scriptures, though truly and catholically translated into vulgar tongues, yet may not be indifferently read of all men, nor of any other than such as have expressed license thereinto of their lawful ordinaries with good testament, testimony from their curates or confessors that they be humble, discreet, and devout persons and like to take much good and no harm thereby. So uh, they didn't approve of indiscriminate reading of the Holy Scriptures by just anybody. That last bit was actually from page 3 of the preface. Now we're on page 9. And I thought this was very interesting uh, regarding translation philosophy. Um, uh, we acknowledge, uh, acknowledging with uh, St. Jerome, that in other writings it is enough to give in translation sense for sense. That is the dynamic equivalent approach. But that in scriptures, lest we miss the sense, we must keep the very words. So they're arguing in favor of a word-for-word -word translation approach. Uh, my last selection from the preface is here on page 12 in a section where the argument is in favor of the Latin Vulgate as the source rather than the Greek text. So they're saying this is the, these are the reasons that they decided to translate from the Vulgate rather than the Greek. And they say, here, reason number 10, it is not only better than all other Latin translations, and there were other Latin translations beside the Vulgate, to include Erasmus's translation and Beza's translation, uh, but uh, then the Greek text itself, the Latin, the Vol Latin Vulgate, is better than the Greek text itself in those places where they disagree. Then they explain why they say that. The proof hereof is evident because most of the ancient heretics were Grecians, and therefore the scriptures in Greek were more corrupted by them, as the ancient fathers often complain. So they're saying you can't trust the Greek, you have to go to the Latin. Um, but the modern Catholic Church now has gone to the Greek. Well, we could, we could go on for hours looking at these notes, because they really are simply fascinating the annotations and, and the end of the chapters and the side column notes. Um, I think this document, this uh, translation, would be very informative to anyone who's interested in the history of those days, 16th, early 17th century, um, particularly the uh, conflicts between um, the Roman Catholics and the uh, Church of England in that time period. Um, if you think that you might have difficulty reading text that's formatted this way, and I can understand that, then there is another option which I believe is in a modern typeface. There is uh, at lulu.com, l-u-l-u.com, there is something called the Original and True Reams New Testament of Anno Domini 1582. And it's only 608 pages. It's also a paperback. So it has to be formatted differently than this, which is well over 700 pages long. Now here we are in the Apocalypse, and I'm looking at pages 739, 745. So the original and true one perhaps is, uh, is in modern typeset. So it might be worth taking a look at that one. Well, I hope uh, you've enjoyed this review, that you've gotten something out of it. I appreciate your taking the time to watch. Please remember to like the video if you do like it, and to subscribe to the channel if you think the channel content is of interest to you. Thanks again for watching.